this series is a, is a really great series for us, especially in the summer, um, just because summer seems to speed up on things, um, and then we get back in the fall, and it's funny how you can't wait for summer, and then you can't wait for fall, <laughs> because there's a little more structure when fall comes. But I can tell you that the last seven years, you know, you always think that um, you're going to arrive somewhere, right? Like our whole, we're, we're just trained in America to arrive. Like you go to college, you have kids, and you arrive at retirement. That's where you arrive, right? And I think that's totally delusional. And we need to strip that of ourselves because this life really is a lot of different journeys, a lot of different missteps, a lot of different ages of time in, in one lifetime. And the last seven years have easily been the hardest of my life, hardest. But I can also tell you it's been the biggest season of growth for me, the biggest season of growth, because that's just how it works. That's how it works. And really all that's happened is my lens has gotten bigger. I see things differently because I see it from a 30,000 foot view rather than just this view. And that doesn't mean I don't believe in truth. That doesn't mean I don't um, have convictions. It just means I, I see things differently. And uh, this guy I read a lot talks about dualistic thinking, how in America we are trained in dualistic thinking. It's either this or that. And oftentimes it's not. Oftentimes it's in the middle. And in a country that's so polarized and so our heels are so dug in on what we believe, this dualistic thinking is killing us. And so really a lot of my growth has been able to take my convictions and see this side and see this side and somehow try to piece it together in the middle. Now, I, I still have goals. I have goals for my life. I have goals for this church. I have a lot of goals. But I can tell you the difference is, is I hold them loosely. I hold them loosely. If, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And that has brought a certain sense of peace in my life. And, and one thing I have realized just in my life and all my wisdom at 41 years old. Every yes to something is a no to something else. I think sometimes when we make decisions, we always think we're just saying yes to this and that's it. But really, it's not. You're, you're saying no to something else when you say yes to something. I mean, go through the list. If you go research a car, you say yes to one car, but you are saying no to another car. You're saying yes to certain features in that car that will break and cost you thousands of dollars. I would give anything for a truck with a roll down window right now, I'm not gonna lie. But you're saying no to something else. Whoever you marry, you're saying yes to that person, but you're saying no to seven billion other ones. Every single decision, you go to college, you, whatever job, whatever it is, you're always saying yes to something, but it also equals a no. And so that's what I'm talking about with dualistic thinking. And it, it really helps us see Christ and the world differently when you start getting breaking out of that. And that's really important for this series because life is, a, it really is a balance, but it's a balance of missteps. <laughs> some things equal death, some things equal life. And we learn from that. Our only, only option is to either learn and grow from that or get bogged down and die. That's really our only option. But I just wanna tell you something, in all my changes, in all my different theological views, I know I'm wrong about some things, I know that. But I'm okay with that. And I'll tell you why. As hard as this seven years has been, I have never wavered on Jesus, never. Have I had doubts about things? Of course, but I've never, ever, ever wavered on Jesus Christ because he's the center. There's a lot of other things I put stock in that have come crumbling down, but I have never wavered on Jesus because I am doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on Jesus Christ. You gotta pick a horse, right? In this life, you have to. And I pick Jesus because I believe he, this is the most important choice we will ever make as who we believe Jesus to be. As C.S. Lewis said, he was either the son of God or he was a madman who should have been put into a, you know, a home. It's one or the other. And today we're gonna talk about this word salvation. 
And salvation is the most important choice that we make. Jesus is salvation. So I've said this a million times, though. I'm not introducing you to a theory. I'm introducing you to a person. So the choice isn't a religion. The choice isn't a doctrine. The choice is not a theology. The choice is a person. But here's the interesting thing. Of the 20,000 different denominations, even the Christian church doesn't agree on salvation. They'll say it's Jesus, but then they'll throw all these caveats in or they'll, they'll put things in the way. And so we're gonna look at salvation because it's the most important choice, but what is salvation? And so I saw this great example that Andy Stanley used. He, he, gave, he showed this picture of a bunch of different rooms and he showed like orthodoxy and Catholicism and um, Anglicanism and evangelicalism and we're all in the same house as Christians, but we're in different rooms. The problem is we all think we're right. Every one of those denominations thinks they're right. We think we're right, 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 right. And so it's interesting that even salvation, which should be very simple, is argued upon and not agreed upon within the same house. So what I'm gonna do today is I am going to confuse you. I'm going to ask you a ton of questions and you need to decide for yourself because I'm not going to be there on your judgment. I won't, you won't be there. So you gotta put your thinking caps on today. As you've heard me preach for years now, it seems like the Western church got rid of the brain when they talked about faith. No, the brain's part of the body, we should process things. So I will bring it all together, I promise. But the main question is, who saved? Who is saved? Are you saved? Am I saved? Who's saved? And what does that actually mean? Some say it's all grace. Some say it's works plus grace. Who's right? So first I just wanna start, as I said, with the church split. Long time ago, 600 years ago, 500 years ago, this guy named Martin Luther went against the Catholic Church. Martin Luther was a priest, by the way, and he was Catholic. <laughs> so sometimes we forget that. But Martin Luther was depressed. He was, he, he, he was so worried about hell, so worried about hell. He literally would flog himself to try to beat the hell out of him, <laughs> pun intended. He was miserable. Now at that time, the Catholic Church was selling indulgences, basically, you could give money to the church and get your relatives out of purgatory. Great business model, by the way. So we are doing a new warehouse project, and if you want to get your relatives out of purgatory, it'll cost you at least $10,000, okay? That's kind of what they were doing, and we have lots of churches around the world built on that, those indulgences. So Martin Luther was right, but here was the difference. Martin Luther, he, he, you know, he, I talked to Father Hightower about this, by the way, and Luther, I mean, the Catholic Church agreed with like 94 of his principles. <laughs> there was just three that they didn't agree with. So he was branded a heretic, and his life was in danger. Luther's life was in danger. But he did start this whole other thing, and it really came down to two things. Luther said it was grace and grace alone. You have nothing to do with it. If God wants to save you, he's gonna save you, and he picks and chooses who he wants to save. That's all his right. The Catholic Church said it's grace plus our effort and our works. Who's right? Pope Leo, at the time, quoted Philippians to prove his point. Philippians 2 says, so then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, continue working out your salvation with awe and reverence for the one bringing forth in you both the desire and the effort for the sake of his good pleasure is God. So that's the verse Pope Leo would quote. It's working out our salvation. There's, there's, there's more to this. Luther quoted Romans 11 all the time. So in the same way, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if it is by grace, it is no longer works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. 
So which one is it? Here's what's fascinating. They were both quoting the Apostle Paul. Both were using Paul to prove their points. So is it grace and grace alone? If God wants to save you, he'll save you, and that's his prerogative. Or is it you're saved, but we work out our salvation? Is there an effort? But that brings up another question. Is it once saved, always saved? Can you lose your salvation? And how does that look? I've heard this in Christian circles. When a Christian gives their life to Jesus and then they backslide or they're, they're in the flesh or they say, maybe they were never saved at all. I have heard that from Christians. Maybe, well, maybe, maybe they didn't mean it when they said the prayer. Well, then it's, it's just all about us. All agree Jesus saves. Some say they're saved through baptism, though. Some say that if they take communion. Some say it's through repentance. But that brings up another question. If you're saved, what is the proof in your life? Because I hear that all the time in Christian circles, too. And that brings up another question. What line is it that you have finally cross to be saved? Like, how, how many sins do you have to get out to prove that you're saved? And what's the line? Because if we're all watching, like, mm, oh, okay, now he's not swearing so much, he must be saved. He put the playboy away, God's finally got him. What's the line? See what I'm saying? We've made this so hard. I saw this post from this hardcore Calvinist dude, and he was he was saying it is heresy for churches to have unrepentant people on their worship team. I was like, we're screwed. <laughs> and I just asked him, well, which ones? Which sins? Which ones? And of course, it always comes down to sexual ones and all that. So I'm like, wait, so, so someone on my worship team, on our worship team, can be really angry and just kind of a curmudgeon if they're standing up for truth. But if they have sexual sin, they're off, right? Like, which ones? Which sins, then, can our worship team have? Yours, mine? I mean, which ones? And that brings up another question. If people think God just picks and chooses who he wants to save and it's all God and God opens your eyes and he grants you repentance, but he doesn't for some people, why would we ever judge those sinners? They just can't see it. Why are, we so, why are those Calvinists so judgmental towards sinners when the sinners just can't see it? And I wanna ask the Calvinist a question. How do you know you're saved? How do you know? How do you know for sure? Because John Calvin even said that God tricks some people into thinking they're saved when they're really not. And that brings up another question. What are we saved from? Some people say we're saved from the Father, his anger, his wrath. We're saved from God. So Jesus, who is God, saved us from himself. Some people say it's from death and sin. Some people say it's from hell. What are we saved from? Who are we saved from? Is everyone having a good time? Do you feel free right now? Do you feel hopeful? This is what Christians fight about right here, what we're talking about. We're gonna be different at Zootown. We're gonna be different. Let's keep going. What did Jesus say? We got a story of a Pharisee. And you got a story in that, excuse me, in that story, you got a Pharisee who was the religious, the, the, the godly ones, the saved ones, the chosen ones. And you got this sinner. And the story goes, the Pharisee says, Lord, thank you so much. I tithe, I give all these things. Thank you for not making me like this sinner over here. I mean, that's social media to a, to a T, okay? And then it says you got the sinner who couldn't even come near the temple and he couldn't even raise his eyes to heaven and he said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, the sinner went home justified. But then you got another story where you got two thieves on a cross and one thief was mocking 
Jesus while the other one came to his senses. And all he said to Jesus was, remember me. No baptism, no communion, no really repentance, no class at church to learn the five points of our church, none of that. And Jesus looks at him and says, you will be with me today in paradise. So let me ask you, is it, is it what you say saves you? Have mercy on me or remember me? Is it what you say? So we had this whole era where the evang evangelistic events would come through town, tent revivals, and you got Billy Graham. Billy Graham supposedly saved millions of people. Do I think God used it? Yes, I do. However, it was about coming forward and saying a sinner's prayer, and then you were saved. But the problem is, is Billy Graham even said, mm, only about 10% of the people really got saved. I'm like, huh? How would you know that? <laughs> See, all they had to do was get out of their seats and they had to come forward and then they had to say the right words and then God saved them. So is it what you say that saves you? Then we have this story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus with a Pharisee of Pharisees, and he comes to Jesus by night. And Jesus looks at him and says, you must be born again. That's what saves you. Not words, not just you must be born again. But then in Luke 20, when Jesus is talking about the afterlife, he says, only those who are worthy will be saved. So which one is it? Then in Matthew 6, Jesus teaches if you, don't, if you are forgiven and you don't forgive others, you will not be forgiven. But one chapter later, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And three chapters later, Jesus says, only those who stand firm to the end will be saved. So what's the question here? Is it what you say? Is it if you're born again? Is it, is it if you forgive others? Is it if you do the Father's will? Or is it if you stand firm? Which one is it? Let's keep going. Some of you are like, please stop. I promise there's hope at the end. You got a guy named Zacchaeus, a hated tax collector. He worked for the IRS. I've been audited once in my life. When they come to your door and knock on your door, and now they have guns. They hired like 80,000 more of these people now. It's an eerie, awful feeling. Okay? If we don't like it now, imagine back then when Zacchaeus was working for the Roman government as a Jew who was stealing money from his own people. So imagine if you get audited and that IRS agent says, you owe this to the government and you owe this to me personally. How would we like that? This guy's going to, he's going straight to hell, right? Straight to hell. But Jesus walks up to him and says, in a tree, by the way, Zacchaeus, in a tree, he says, I must have dinner with you tonight. The crazy part about that story is we have no clue what Jesus says to this guy. We have no clue the interaction. We have no clue the conversation. It seems like it was just a really good meal. And it's, Zacchaeus stands up and says, I will, give, I will give back all the money I've give, done taken from people and who I've wronged. And Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. So is it giving money? We have a warehouse project. Then you got another story where a man is paralyzed and his friends take him to Jesus. They can't get in the door. They dig a hole through the roof, lower him through the roof. They're pretty sure that was Peter's mother-in-law's house, by the way. <laughs> Hence why Peter's upset all the time. And Jesus looks at him. The guy says nothing. The guy says nothing. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And then he says, by the faith of your friends, you have been saved. One of my favorite stories is you got this lady 
who crashes this party, man. She, the, she, Jesus is eating dinner with the Pharisees, and this woman was known as being a little loose around town. And she comes busting in the door. I always picture her with this wild hair, just busting in the door where she could have been stoned for it. And she gets down, doesn't say a word, and w- cries on Jesus' feet and wipes her tears with her hair. And he said, she is the one who's forgiven and saved. Doesn't say a word. So here's the question. Is it if you give money? Is it someone else's faith? Or is it you say nothing at all, you just cry, that saves you? Which one is it? Let's move on to Paul. These are good ones. Paul is questioned about divorce. It's a woman who's who's a believer in Jesus and her husband is not. And she's asked, the question's asked, should I divorce my husband because he's not a believer? And Paul says this, and if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is happy to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified because of the wife and the unbelieving wife because of her husband. This is a good one, ladies, you'll love this. First Timothy two, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman, because she was fully deceived, fell into transgression, but she will be delivered through childbearing if she continues in faith and love and holiness with self-control. That message really flies in 2023, huh? So here's the question. Are husbands saved by their believing wife? Is a wife saved by having kids? But only if she continues. Finally, Romans 11. This is probably my favorite. Paul, Romans is the most misused book in all the Bible because people cherry pick verses. You gotta get to the end of Romans. Paul is making a case and he says this. And so all Israel will be saved. As it was written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. He just does it. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. He just does it. In regard to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. The the Jews were persecuting the Christians. But in regard to election, they are dearly loved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. All Israel will be saved. But then verse 32, Paul says, for God has consigned all people, that's us, to disobedience so that he may show mercy to them all. So does your bloodline save you? Just being a Jew, does that save you? Or is it just being a part of all people? Because he says he will have mercy on all. Let's bring this together. One of the reasons, I'll just explain to you that I, I, I show you a difference between the Western church and the Eastern church. There's a, there is a huge difference. What happened with Martin Luther and the church split and all that stuff caused some major damage. It just did. The church was always supposed to fight it out together. However, here we are. Here's one of the problems. If you grew up in church, in the Western church, here's one of the issues, is it became just a get out of hell free card. Just say the right words, say the prayer, get baptized, and that's all it is. Just get a hell out of free card. And really what happened is, is it became there's no security in your salvation, and it moved into legalism. Because then you have to prove that you're saved. Look at all these good things I'm doing. (laughs) So let me just say this. Jesus did not save us from hell later, but from hell now. From hell now. There has been things that has come out of this mouth that are straight from the pits of hell. And you you don't feel good after you say it or you do it. That is hell. And we are commissioned to build a kingdom right now, right now. And so think in the spirit. Salvation is all God, it's all mercy, it's all grace. The name of Jesus means God is salvation. God starts it, God finishes it. 
And you gotta remember this, put your thinking caps on. There's no such thing as time to God. There's no such thing as time. He sees, you know, I mean, you know, I talked about a bigger lens. He has the biggest lens. He's not running out of time. All, all time started on the cross. That's when time really started. Jesus said this in John 12. Now is the judgment of this world. Now. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. All people. This is how crazy it is. This is so big to some denominations. They say, well, all people doesn't mean all people. It means all different cultures. <laughs> the Greek means all people. All people will be drawn to Jesus Christ. Now, I got in big trouble about five years ago for saying this. I'm gonna double down on this, all right? I believe in this. This is the truth. Everybody is saved. Everybody is forgiven. On the cross, Jesus said it. He did it. He did everything. It's just some don't know it and some don't care. That word in Greek, when he says, I will draw all people to myself, that word in Greek means drag. I will drag you kicking and screaming to the throne of God. Don't we do that to our children? I don't like the leash thing now, it's just kind of weird, but I was tempted. Oh, you wanna go do that or I just told you not to? How about I drag you face first into the house? Now, are they happy about it? Do they wanna go do it again? Yeah. No, they're not happy about it, but they wanna go do it again. But after a while, they get it. He will drag all people to himself. Karl Barth, the famous theologians, they asked him, when were you saved? Because we always want a date. When I said the prayer, when I took communion, when I got baptized, Karl Barth said in 33 AD. Jesus was on a cross and says, it is finished, it is done, it's accomplished, it's over. And we're like, how can we help? But you either live in darkness and not see it, or you live in pride and you don't want it. That's the choice. But it doesn't change Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. However, let me bring this together. Salvation is not a one-time thing. It's a daily thing, a moment thing. It's a choice of tripping upwards. There are things in my life that are killing me that I want God to kill so I can attain salvation in that moment. And the Western church has just said, you know what? We're all sinners someday. We're gonna die and then God's gonna make us perfect. No, Jesus never said that. He says, be perfect now. And that's what salvation is. When you know your sins are forgiven, when you know that you are accepted and you are loved, that's the motivation to want to get better. But it's a choice. So now we spend a lifetime getting hell out of us. And that does take an effort. Luther and Pope Leo were both right. It does take an effort. Like, look, I, I mentioned this a lot. Like, you know, I, I don't like going to the gym anymore. I'm 41 years old. I'm tired of going to the gym. But I do it because it's good for you. <laughs> One thing I am gonna do is stop looking at 20-year-old influencers on social media, though, because I'm like, nah, I'm hurting. I'm sore. But I don't stop because it's an effort. You, if you don't give effort, you die. You don't use your muscles. It's the same way with salvation. If it's like, yep, Jesus did it, I'm good. That's not scriptural, and you're never going to get these things out. It does take an effort. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, I wanna make it clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel that I preach to you, that you received, in which you stand, there's the firm, and by which you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the message I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. 
So notice it says you're being saved. Every time God delivers me from some sin or something in my life, it's like I'm born again. It really is. Because I've been dealing with this for 40 years and finally there's a breakthrough and you feel alive. That's being saved. That's being saved. This is why I love golf, man. Golf's the best preacher sport. Because when you got three other dudes and you hit a bad shot and you're ready for that thing to come out of your mouth, but you have what? Self-control. That's one of the fruits of the spirit. And then I go behind a tree and I go. <laughs> but it feels like you're alive. Isn't it great as you get older and like the things that used to bug you now, you're kind of like, eh. That's being saved. Getting rid of some of these things. We are constantly being saved. Now look, at the end there it says, unless you believed in vain. And that's the verse that many Christians say, see, Maybe you weren't saved at all. That's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is it's in vain. You believe it, but you're not using it. You're not doing anything with it. This is why the word perseverance comes up a lot in the scriptures, because we are making stumbles, we are tripping, we are sinning, but we are moving upward in salvation. And if we persevere every day, every moment, our whole life, we are being saved. So here's the reason that I'm doing this series. One, it's just, to, it's just to free you guys. It's just to free you guys so much. Jesus Christ finished the job. He did it. And the good news is just too good for some people. But there is an effort to this. And I can tell you, especially the last, like, see, I told you this a few weeks ago. Crap hit the fan in many areas of my life because I was pursuing Jesus. Not because I wasn't. Because when you pursue Jesus, he's like, okay. And he shines the light here, and he shines the light here, and he shines the light here. But it didn't mean I'm not saved, and it doesn't mean you're not saved. And it's the whole process of Christianity isn't, I'm in hell, I'm in heaven. I'm in hell, I'm in heaven. That's not it. Jesus said, death in Hades has been defeated. I have not. My ego, my pride, my judgmentalism, my anger, those have been not, but they have gotten way better because I have pursued Jesus. Again, I said it a few weeks ago, I have so many of you being like, Scott, you just look free, you look light. It came from a lot of effort, you guys. I didn't wake up one day and go, oh. so I pull my CPAP off my face. <laughs> So look, here's why I'm doing this. I love this church. I love you guys. I'm so, glad, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you persevered through so many things in this church, all kinds. I'm so glad. But I, I, just, read, I just read a statistic that 20% of Christians read their Bibles. 20%. Some of you were like, mm. I'm not here to judge you, man. I'm not here to do that. But it's hurting you. I mean, we fill our brains with social media and Fox News and CNN and all this stuff, and we're, we're like, why do I feel so stressed? It takes an effort to sit down. As a pastor, do I wanna read my Bible every day? Not all the time, guys. But I can tell you when I do it, I'm like, thanks, God. The difference is, in the Western church, I'm gonna read my Bible so good things happen to me, and I wanna be blessed. That's not why you read your Bible. It's so you gain wisdom of the ancients. So we gotta break through this. So here's why I'm doing this series. You're gonna mess up. Everyone gets lost, everyone trips. Let's trip up. Let's trip upward. I love it now when people confess their sins to me and I go, that's amazing. And they're like, what? I go, that's amazing that you see that. That's amazing that God has revealed that to you. That's amazing that you're not justifying that. Congratulations. I never say now, maybe you believed in vain. I'm like, that's so rad that you're confessing that and you're struggling instead of putting the mask on. Like, it's good, it's fine, everything's fine. I wanna renew our love for Jesus. I wanna renew our love for community. And I'm just telling you, like, we keep thinking there's gonna be a breakthrough in society and life. It's not, it's not going to happen, you guys. We thought as soon as COVID gets over, we're all gonna go, <sighs> no, we have it. 
It's never going to change. But we can change. We can change. We need to renew our commitment to Christ. We need to renew our commitment to truth and to grace. It's a confusing, it's, I was talking to Father Jarmus about this. It's so weird right now. It's almost like McCarthyism, communism, nationalism, all these isms converging into one. But we are the church. We are the Jesus followers. We were never called to just fit in. Malcolm Mugridge says, only dead fish swim downstream. But the point isn't to change society. The point isn't to get whoever's elected. I mean, you really think if Donald Trump gets elected, things are gonna change like socially? Like we're gonna stop fighting? <laughs> but we have a choice. So I'm doing this series to just, everyone just, you're saved. You're good. Jesus did it. But now let's make a little effort to this. Let's make a discipline to this. So we can actually have the peace that passes understanding while the rest of the world freaks out. And it's attainable, it really is, but it takes an effort of tripping up. Band, you can come on out. Jesus said this in John 12, right after he says, he will draw all men to himself. He says, the one who loves this, his life destroys it. And the one who hates his life in this world guards it for eternal life. I preached on that a few weeks ago. It's actually a beautiful verse. He's like, if, you, if, if, if you've created this false self that you're gonna hold on to, it's gonna equal death. But if you come to me and I show you who you truly are, then it equals life. And so you are saved. Like it or not, you're saved. <laughs> and it's at your disposal. But there's an effort to this. There's a thought process to this. So where I'm at is I can, I can see the absurdity of our society, but I'm not so worried about other people now. I'm worried about me. Because what I realize is if someone else can take your peace, then you don't really have peace. Peace is something you have no matter what the circumstances. So I know there's so many things we could boycott right now. How about we boycott our own sin? Boycott our own pride, boycott our own ego. How about we boycott that? Because that is what equals life. And I thought of this, I thought, I thought of this story, it's such a great story, this true story, where th there was this prince and his father was the king. And this prince was a little wild. And this prince was acting in all these terrible ways. And all the people were like, oh my gosh, that guy's gonna be king someday. But the king kept having grace on his son. But the king also kept training his son on how to be a king. And finally, the king says to his young son, he says, you know, you're a prince now, but if you only knew what you were gonna be someday, you'd start acting like it now. And it changed the whole trajectory and this prince became a great king because he started acting like a king before he was the king. And that's where we're at right now. As Christians, again, you're gonna fall, you're gonna sin, you're gonna do all these things, but we need to, don't give up. But someday we are gonna be in glory with God the Father. And he says, if you only knew what you were gonna become, you'd start acting like that now. And so honestly, this is where I'm at. Like, I wanna get hell out now. <laughs> I wanna get evil out now. And it comes from tripping up. It comes from making mistakes. It comes from all those things. But rather than justifying it and stuff, I wanna act like the king and the prince that I'm going to become. And that's what this whole series is about. It's becoming what we were meant, oh no. It's becoming what we were meant to become. So would you stand with me in prayer? Every week we pray for people at church and if you'd like prayer, um, go to the Hello booth, you can fill it out, I'll make it discreet. But this is an important time that we bring all our prayers as a community before God. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. We pray for the college and high school graduates. 
We pray for their minds, for their souls. And we pray that they work out their salvation with many missteps. But that you, God, we know are raising a generation, a generation of followers of you, a generation who's gonna learn from the mistakes of my generation. And so we pray your blessings upon them. Upon these high school kids, whether they're going to college or not, we pray for this new life, that this new life is found in you. And we look forward to this generation's success and growth as human beings. Father, we bring Leah from our church before you who is dealing with a lot of trauma, a lot of past hurts, a lot of past hard feelings, and frankly, a lot of abuse. And we pray for her and we bring her before the mercy seat of your kingdom. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, peace I leave you, peace I give you. And as we trip up in salvation, the goal is peace. Peace with God, peace with ourselves, peace with others. So before you come up and take communion, which is God's sign of peace with you, his blood and his body was his sign of peace, please show each other a sign of peace. Lord God, the Holy One, together with the countless multitudes of angels, we cry out to you and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. The whole earth is full of your glory. Your works are great and marvelous. Your ways are just and true. You formed the human being from the dust of the earth and breathed into us the breath of life, creating us in your own image and likeness. But we exchanged your truth for the serpent's lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than you, our creator. Although we had sentenced ourselves to death, you did not forsake us in our captivity. Instead, you showed us mercy. You gave us the law as a custodian and when the fullness of time had come, you sent us your only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Being found in human form, he humbled himself becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in memory of me. And the death your Christ died, he died to sin once and for all. And having been raised from the dead, death no longer has dominion over him. And therefore, as often as we drink this bread or eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's life-giving death until he comes. Now, Father, may your Holy Spirit descend upon us and may the power of the Most High overshadow us and you, the God of peace, will sanctify us completely, preserving our whole spirit, soul, and body blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to you, our God, forever and ever. Amen.